But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. We're back 130 years after Vincent van Gogh wrote his letter on June the 2nd. It's a passage of eight days that have gone by, a week and one day since his previous letter. And what is really interesting is between now and his death, um, there was no passage of time uh, longer than eight days where, in other words, where he didn't write a letter. So in other words, between now and his death at the end of July, every letter he wrote was within uh, six, usually one, two, three days or whatever. And so, but the only time that there was a similar passage of time, a similar gap between letters was um, in the week of his death. So we've just had a passage of eight days, quite a long silence from him. He's quite a, a talkative guy in terms of letter writing, certainly, probably um, in person as well. And so this silence is, is kind of unusual. We can... Uh, assume that on the one hand there was this gap because he was getting himself kind of um, sorted out in Orvais who was on the other hand maybe is waiting for a response from his brother and maybe it's both uh, in any event we're going to find the answer to why there was this kind of a long gap and his state of mind how is he getting along in his new place um, how is he getting along with the, the, the new people that he's met what is happening? What is his mindset? We're going to look at all of that in this episode. Before we get to that, a quick announcement. Uh, today um, is um, the first day that a brand new series is launched on my channel on Patreon. It's the Axe Murders, the inside the trial of Henry von Breda. Um, I wrote five books on that case, and so I'm just on Patreon showing some of the backstory to that. Um, I was, you know, obviously present in court. I took a lot of photos of Henry, and then I also, um, on a couple of occasions, Henry looked straight at me while I was photographing him, and those actually became the the book covers for book one and book two. So it's actually quite a fascinating uh, insight into that trial but also into the mind of a triple x murderer if you think chris the chris watts case is shocking this one is 10 times more shocking obviously any person dying in a crime is bad but certainly in terms of shock value this is pretty um incredible and you wouldn't expect it from a guy that that looks sort of sleepy and wouldn't know to fly that was one's impression of henry so if you're interested in that, head on to Patreon. It's on the $3.50 uh, tier, and it's updated every Tuesday. More photos and uh, more analysis of, of that narrative. Also in June, I'll be uploading two Pollyannas to the $5 tier. I'm just finalizing book two, Beneath the Oil. Okay, so with that done, uh, let's get on with today's episode. Uh, for the new subscribers, there are around about three or four hundred of you that have subscribed since a couple of days ago. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, there will be another um, episode on the Madeleine McCann case uh, after this one, either on the third or the fourth uh, sometime then, so look out for that. If you're interested in uh, coverage of the Madeleine McCann case and ongoing coverage of the Chris Watts case, uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Okay, so this is quite interesting. Uh, in the chronology online at vangochletters.org, they actually incorrectly show it as a letter to Theo, but it's actually a letter from Theo on Monday, the 2nd of June, 1890. So that's quite interesting. We're getting a response from Theo quite a few days late to Vincent's letter. And it's from Paris on the 2nd of June, 1890. Theo writes, My dear Vincent, last week I was very busy with the 
Raffaelli exhibition. Uh, we stayed open until 10 o'clock in the evening. Without that, I would already have replied to your last letter. I hope that the area continues to please you and that your boarding house is good. At Mia Serrans in Barbizon, people paid 5 francs or 4 francs 50 if they stayed there a long time, and it was excellent. When I was in Auvers, I dined with my friend Martin in an inn that was down below. There was the was there, I think, meaning the river, um, next, next some fields, the main road, and this inn was on the road. One ate extremely well there in those days and not expensively. I must come one time and I'm very receptive to your proposal that I should come with Joe and the little one for I feel quite emptied and the countryside would do me good. But we must also see mother and Joe's parents. If I can have around three weeks holiday, we'd first go to you and then to Holland. That would be at the beginning of August probably. It would do us all a lot of good to spend a little time in the country. What you write about Dr. Gachet interests me a great deal. I hope that you'll become good friends with him. I'd very much like to have a friend who was a doctor, for at every turn one would like to know, especially for the little one, where illnesses come from. Fortunately, he's quite well, but a week ago we'd gone to St. Cloud, and there we were caught unawares by a torrential rain, the like of which I've never seen. The cafe where we took refuge was flooded. There was a good foot of water. That and the jostling in the evening to get the train made us worried, but all he had was a heavy cold and Joe had nothing, although milk would probably no longer have been good. That can happen with wet feet. The parcel arrived here, returned from saint Rami, and I'm sending it to you. Dr. Peyron told me about it when asking for news of you. We'll be happy to have news from you. If you were here, the little one would smile nicely at you. How detached from all other preoccupations is the smile of a child. Good handshake and warm regards from Joe and the little one, Theo. Uh, I must say it's quite an incredible letter to read, um, given the circumstances. Um, we're getting quite a lot of information here from his brother um, that they a little bit worried about their health. Um, you know, it seems like they were caught in a shower of rain. It looks like the little child got caught a cold or something. And um, I think what stands out the most in Theo's letter to Vincent is he sort of, in kind of a nice way, says to him, look, we do want to come and see you, but that's going to depend on if I get three weeks leave and also, um, you know, we have to go and see... Joe's parents, because he's married, Theo's married, he's been married a year, and he also needs to go and see his own mother, uh, also Vincent's mother, to show them their child. And um, so he, he says, look, um, I'll tell you what, if I get three weeks holiday, I will go to you first, and then we'll go to Holland. And uh, interestingly, when I traveled to... to um, or Ves, who was, I, I repeated that journey as well. I traveled from Ves, who was, to Paris and then from Paris to Holland by train. And that was certainly a journey in itself. Shouldn't have taken a long time in this day and age, but it, it, it was quite a, quite a long, tiring journey uh, because of uh, technical problems and I think work on the railway. So. But uh, we'll get to that in due course. Um, so the other thing that is quite uh, sad, I guess, in retrospect, is Theo says that this, this, this is likely to be in, at the beginning of August. He says this trip to visit Vincent, in, to, in, in terms of the family trip to visit Vincent and then visit their parents, is likely to be at the beginning of August, so just after when Vincent actually died. So you, one kind of gets the idea that Vincent was very much looking forward to becoming sort of part of the community again. You know, he'd been in an asylum. You know, pe people talk today about going into asylum, like a, a almost like solitary confinement. But, you know, someone who's in asylum, you're in a state of being kind of ostracized in a, in a way. And so uh, Van Gogh was literally in an asylum 
with n- no real friendly faces around him. You know, he was literally surrounded by sick people and mad people. And no one that sort of understood his sophisticated attitudes to art and life and and all that kind of thing. And now he's back. He's back in sort of the the thick of things in a way, but he's not. He's sort of in Paris, but he's not. He's just outside of Paris. And that made actually quite a big difference because although he's quite close to his brother, he's far enough that that his brother and his brother's family kind of felt wow it is a bit of a it is a bit of a um step for us to to come and see you you know it, it is a bit of an expedition not really i mean it really wasn't that far but but i guess to them it just felt like you know it, it is kind of a big undertaking and so van gogh arrives in Auvers, he was and he's sort of he's ready to have this ongoing reunion and just sort of you know start socializing with people and within you know the first week of arriving the his brother kind of tells him uh, dude I'm, I'm gonna see you maybe in in two months from now and that that had to sting that had to hurt the, the fact that his brother isn't sort of um, how can I put it has doesn't have that kind of urgency to see him Certainly not the kind of urgency Van Gogh himself is is feeling, and part of the reason is his brother's kind of moved on. His brother's gotten married. His brother's got a child. His brother's got to bring in an income, and he's busy. And that's why he he starts his letter saying, "I was very busy with an exhibition, and you know we were up until ten o'clock at night, and so on." So he's kind of very preoccupied with his family. And he's sort of aware of his brother, but but it's kind of on the back burner. As soon as um, a letter comes from Vincent, he's very much sort of trying to deal with it conscientiously. But he, he kind of you kind of get the sense that Vincent's no longer his absolute priority, and one doesn't quite get that feeling from Vincent. V- Vincent's brother is his priority. Vincent's brother is the guy who's going to. Um, almost make or break the rest of his life you know um, his brother is going to either sell his art or not sell his art and, and what is Vincent's identity what, what does he do he's an artist so he absolutely needs his brother to buy into what he's doing and believe in him and all that kind of thing I'm not saying he's not doing it I'm just saying that his brother kind of has other priorities and that had to be hard on Vincent especially after a year of such loneliness and so I think what Vincent didn't expect is to arrive in Orvesh, who was, be quite close to his brother, and for this horrible lonely t- loneliness to be persisting. And, and what can be more lonely than you are now, you, you can't in your mind rationalize why your family are not visiting you uh, because you on the other side of France, they are now just an hour away. They're nearby, but, but they're not visiting you um now either and and this is just one week into it so you know it's maybe it's not the the penny hasn't quite dropped that it's that bad but it's certainly um his brother sort of um given him kind of quite express um uh, intentions you know i will see you maybe at the beginning of august you know for for a holiday in other words we will come and stay in Orvez for a couple of days, as, a, as in part of the summer holiday, but only in the beginning of August. And that was two months from then. And as, as you know, Van Gogh was, would, would die before that actually happened, unfortunately. And so this is something that is sort of going to hang over the next two months, this, this long summer, this long lonely summer. And uh, one certainly has got to feel for him. Just another thing to point out before we go to Vincent's reply, which is written on the 3rd of June, which is which would be tomorrow, so 130 years ago tomorrow, um, is just where Theo writes about the smile of his child and, you know, the preoccupations in the smile of a child. And he's just saying how, you know, a child lives in a completely different world. 
And I'm certainly experiencing that a little bit where I've taken on a, a puppy, a little miniature schnauzer, and this little animal has its own little world. And um, you've, you've sort of got to, to some extent, you are a prisoner to it, but to some extent you're also um, very enamored by it. You're enamored by his world, um, a world where things of, are are needed to sniff at and to run after and and you know when I, I today I went uh, walking with him and I went on my mountain bike with him running sort of alongside and just he's so happy and excited about what he's doing that he's sort of barking I mean it's, it's the human equivalent of running and shouting with joy and um, why not you know why, why not um, sort of go out and move and, and feel alive and, and express that, you know, in a, in a simple sort of way. And so Theo's kind of experiencing that with his child, that, that his child is giving him something to think about again beyond his brother. So now let's look at Vincent's response to Theo's letter and Something that I think is quite important to mention just at the outset is one of the things true crime teaches you is to look at things in different dimensions. So one dimension is to look at things from a from a distance. That, so in, or, in order to see the woods, what are the woods that we're seeing? And so in terms of this, what we see is invariably Theo's letters to Vincent are quite short. You kind of get the sense that you know they're kind that they're not um, abrupt and they're not brief they're just on the shorter side and relative to vincent's letters they're shorter and that's because he's a busy man he's got other um, business to take care of he's got other things to look after he's not just he's not got as much time on his hands as vincent does he doesn't have as much time to think about things as Vincent does. He doesn't have as much time to write letters as Vincent does. But I think it's just important to emphasize that even in terms of the letters, each letter from Theo is shorter. I'm talking about every single letter is relatively shorter than Vincent's letters. And you kind of get then a sense of imbalance between the brothers. They're brothers, but the older brother doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have a companion. And his companion is, is his art, and his art is also his curse. You know, as long as his art doesn't sell, he feels himself a failure, but, but so, do, so, so do the people around him. You know, it's like, oh, are you, um, you know, painting another painting? The other side of it is, obviously, Vincent's got a lot to say, because a lot is going on in his heart. He's... He's uh, working very hard, but is he getting anything for it? And it's not just money. You know, I think probably what matters more to him is being accepted by society, being seen as a functional member of society, as someone with a job. And he considers himself to be someone with a job. But right? he considers himself to be working. But I think there's a part of him that feels injured and embarrassed by the fact that he is not actually um, how can I put it is not accepted in a mainstream way by the people around him you know one kind of gets the idea that the people around him largely are quite dismissive of him and think of him as eccentric and um, not crazy but someone who's lost the plot to some extent someone who's a misfit someone who is struggling someone who is kind of a not a failure but someone who is um, not in the bosom of society someone who's fallen by the wayside kind of thing the bungled and the botched kind of thing and is that not true is that is, is uh, you know if you think about this guy who's lost his ear and you know he was in an artist situation in all and, and he got sort of kicked out of all and you know one does get the, it does look like that it does look like 
a bungled and botched person. And so Vincent's got to fight against that perception, not only of others, but of his own family and, and even of himself. And his art is giving him that, but it's also taking that away from him as long as it doesn't sell. And as we know, it didn't sell. So let's look at uh, Vincent's letter. He writes, My dear Theo, for several days now I've I'd have liked to write to you with a rested mind, but have been absorbed in work. This is quite an incredible sentence because he's kind of saying, you know, I've been meaning to write to you, but, um, you know, and with a, a mind at peace. And, he, and then he gives the reason for that, well, he's been absorbed in work. Well, the other reason is also, so is Theo. Theo has also been absorbed in work. And is, that seems to be his response. He seems to be saying, well, I'm also working. And it's not really true, is it? It's not quite the same thing. And one does, and I mean, think about it. Uh, Vincent wrote back kind of immediately after Theo wrote, whereas Theo didn't write back immediately after Vincent wrote. So can you feel that tension that's sort of there? It's not obviously um, an incredible amount of tension, but it's, something that Vincent would definitely be feeling in his loneliness and it's something that Theo wouldn't necessarily be feeling that much in his busyness, right? So he goes on in his letter, he says, this morning your letter arrives, for which I thank you. So just by saying that, this morning your letter arrives, he's kind of saying, I got your letter this morning and I'm now writing back to you the same day, right? He says, for which I thank you and for the 50 franc note it contained. And so, I don't know if you remember in the previous letter, he was saying, you know, I'm going to run out of money by the end of the week kind of thing. Well, that's kind of what Theo's letter is also to do. It's to give him money. It's not just to say hi. It's not just pleasantries. It's also kind of maintenance, right? So... He goes on to say, yes, I think that it would be good for many reasons that we were all together again here for a week of your holidays. That's really the third sentence of his letter. So he's kind of saying, you know, th that's important to me. Um, I'd really like that to happen. Right. And he says, um, if if longer isn't possible. So he's also saying, well, if, if, if you can stay longer, that'll also be good. And then he then he says the following. I often think of you. Joe and the little one. And I see that the children here look well in the healthy, fresh air. This is something he's really emphasizing. He's emphasizing what a healthy place this is. And, I mean, he's obviously come to Orves who was to regain his health, more like his mental health and his sanity. And But that's the kind of selling point that he's pushing onto his brother. He's saying, you should come here now. You, you know, you guys need to come here to get healthy too. And anyway, he says, and yet it's difficult enough to raise them even here. All the more is it rather terrible sometimes to keep them safe and sound in Paris on the fourth floor. So he's kind of, again, pushing the narrative onto his brother saying, you know, you in this apartment in Paris, you should really come here. It's, it's safe. It's, you know, the, the, the children can run around and it's easy to raise. It's almost like he's saying you should move here as well. You should move here from Paris. And then he says, but anyway, one must take things as they are. Mr. Gachet says that father and mother must feed themselves quite naturally. He talks of taking two liters of beer a day and in those amounts. But you'll certainly enjoy furthering your acquaintance with him. And he's already counting on it, speaks of it every time I see him, that you'll all come. So he's still emphasizing, you know, now through a third party that that Theo's presence is sort of being anticipated in Orves who was, right? I, I find it quite interesting that he refers to Dr. Gachet in this way. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means by that Mr. Gachet says that father and mother must feed themselves quite naturally. He talks of taking two liters of beer. I don't, know, don't quite know what that means. But I do take note of him mentioning alcohol at this point so bear in mind van gogh is now out of the asylum and he can now do sort of whatever he wants he can paint he can um, write to his brother he can wander the fields but he can also do things that are less healthy like 
drink alcohol and also um, womanize, right, and things like that. Now, one of the things that I've had a problem with in in Kirk Douglas's Oscar-nominated portrayal of Van Gogh in Lust for Life, it's the 1956 film, what I really found laughable about that film is how do you portray loneliness? How do you dramatize loneliness? And so quite a few times you see Kirk Douglas sort of gritting his teeth, um, widening his eyes, uh, you know, staring up at the sky, bawling his fists and sort of trembling, um, you know, gnashing his teeth in front of a mirror. Is that what loneliness looks like? <laughs> Is that what loneliness sounds like? Is, is that how you portray loneliness? And I, I can tell you, as someone who's written almost 100 books, writing books is quite a lonely life as well. You, you don't experience, I mean, loneliness is something that's actually invisible. You, you're not necessarily going to see it in someone's face and they're certainly not going to gnash their teeth or anything like that. So if you have to say, well, how do you dramatize it? Well, there are symptoms of loneliness and one of the symptoms is drinking. People who are really lonely but in a broken-hearted way will drink a lot uh, almost like to excess almost like as, as an alcoholic or something that's just one example they might take drugs as well but it's kind of that behavior is the sign of loneliness so so drinking is an aspect that's not something you really see in lust for life um, another aspect is you might drink and be ashamed of it so you hide it away so it's furtive drinking also drinking when, um, you know, you can almost imagine Van Gogh gets the letter from Theo and then sees, well, Theo's only going to be here uh, maybe in August, reach for a bottle of alcohol or absinthe or whatever the case may be. But another way to dramatize it is he's reading this letter, he sees the thing about August and then you just look at his face. You just look into his eyes, you just see the, the eyelids blinking. And that is going to tell you he's registering this. And you, you don't necessarily have to see it dramatized, but you can intuit that that has got to sting, given the whole context of everything else. And that is what is missing in people who try and understand Van Gogh. is Their understanding is just so shallow and it's so fragmented that you don't need to really work that hard to get Van Gogh. He's not that sophisticated or that difficult to understand. It just takes a little bit of time to understand it. You just got to look into his eyes and look into his face and you'll see it. But this whole explicit gnashing of teeth is, is ridiculous. I also think it's interesting how Van Gogh refers to Dr. Gachet. Well, he actually refers to him as Mr. Gachet, interestingly, and how he's referring to this doctor who's talking about drinking alcohol. Then you find that quite interesting. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, this is after he talks about speaking of it every time I see him, in terms of speaking of you coming to visit every time I see him. He says, he certainly appears to me as ill and confused as you or I, and he's older and a few years ago he lost his wife, but he's very much a doctor and his profession and his faith keep him going however. So... This is an incredible disclosure of Dr. Gesha. Now, remember, I'm making the case that this is Van Gogh's murderer. Now, listen to how he describes him. He just mentioned the alcohol. Now he says, he appears to me as ill and, conf and confused as you or I. And I, I find that quite interesting that he refers to his brother as also as ill and confused. As, as if he knows his brother also has some kind of illness which he did. His brother died, Theo died six months later. But it's very interesting that he, this is in the very first days that he's met Dr. Gachet, he's already got a mixed feelings about the guy. He kind of says, you know, he's, he's um, that there's something not kosher about this guy. He doesn't just describe him as ill, he's, he's describing the doctor as sick. He also s describes him as confused. I don't know whether he means by confused anxious or paranoid or something like that, but obviously there's something 
in Van Gogh's mind that is wrong with this doctor. And he also says he's older and in other words than him and his brother. So he's an older guy, but but he's kind of saying he's an older guy who's more confused than what we are, something like that. And then he talks about a few years ago he lost his wife. And there is already bringing in a aspect that is part of the identity of Dr. Gachet, which is he's a widower. Now, what happened to his wife? Why is his wife dead? And bear in mind, you, you, you now have a situation where you have a doctor treating someone else and he's lost his own wife. What happened to his wife? Now, you might say whatever happened to his wife was just you know, completely normal and completely natural. But the, the, this is a doctor. Was he, the, the doctor not able to save his wife? And irrespective of that aspect, you also have the trauma of, I've lost my wife, how am I going to deal with it? And so you've got a guy, a doctor, that is dealing with the, the trauma of having lost his partner. And you've also got Van Gogh, who's, who's got the trauma of, having lost certain social attachments as well. First of all, um, Paul Gogar, you know, that, that whole Holocaust in the Yellow House. You've got that. And then you've also got the fragile relationship with his brother. Vincent didn't always get along that great with Theo, but for the most part they did. And now th that relationship's under a little bit of strain. Now it is a case of, hi Theo, I'm now just around the corner from you, can you come and see me? Now, unfortunately, because of the situation, Vincent sort of feels he can't go and see them. In other words, his state of mind, you know, he can't travel, he can't take risks or whatever. So he's, he's still the invalid, he's just in Orvez now. And now the question is, is his brother going to show that, he, that, he, that there's this sort of filial love, you know, like, is his brother going to show up? Is his brother going to prove that he loves him? And, of course, he does love him, but is he going to demonstrate that? Well, that that's something else completely. And so there's probably going to be a bit of trauma then, as we all know, or as we should know, Van Gogh kind of has a bit of an attachment problem. Because he's so lonely, he feels it when he's not being visited. He feels it when somebody leaves. He feels it when he's not getting the kind of um, fulfillment or relationship that he wants. And now we have a situation where his friendship with Dr. Gachet, Dr. Gachet also has some kind of um, trauma associated with someone very, very close to him. And I don't know if you remember in a previous letter, Van Gogh said, well, it was quite strange um, seeing a small break on, on the doctor's grief-stricken face. So you kind of get the sense that the doctor himself isn't a very happy camper and has got to counsel Van Gogh on happiness. B bearing in mind the whole suicide narrative, be bearing, bear in mind if Van Gogh's problem is that he's suicidal, look at the doctor who's counseling him, a grief-stricken doctor who's lost his wife. So what is quite interesting is he talks about his profession and his faith keep him going. So in this we get the idea that the doctor's a um, religious guy and his, doct his, his, uh, his job keeps him going. And so obviously his religion is part of the doctor's makeup. And I think that's also quite important is what is your religion going to dictate about the kind of person you are? And bear in mind... Uh, Van Gogh's father was a minister as well and, and he was at odds with his own father. It wasn't that he didn't believe in God, he just had a different attitude to to God and, and it was a Protestant faith and it was also a faith based on being very humble, being very, almost taking the, the peasant approach to um, humbling yourself and bringing yourself down to the same level. And now this doctor, what, what is his approach to people and to 
his fellow man? Does he see himself as the way Van Gogh does, as just like everybody else, on the same level, or does he see himself above everybody else? And think about that and how artists generally are in terms of there's a kind of a snootiness involved uh, associated with artists and the art community and the art crowd. Now, where do you think the doctor fell in terms of that? Where do you think Van Gogh falls in, in terms of that? So Van Gogh kind of obliquely refers to him as being older. So he says he's ill and confused and he's also older and he's lost his wife. So they're both kind of bachelors. Um, Van Gogh has never gotten married, but it is, is single for all intents and purposes. And the doctor is also, for all intents and purposes, single, but they men of different ages and, to some extent, different sensibilities. So let's go on. He says, we're already firm friends, and by chance he also knew Breas of Montpellier and has the same ideas on him as I have that he's someone important in the history of modern art. I'm working on his portrait, the head with a white cap, very fair, very light, the hands also in light carnation, a blue frock coat and a cobalt blue background, leaning on a red table, on which are a yellow book and a foxglove plant with purple flowers. Now, again, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see this. If you look at the famous, the world famous uh, portrait of Dr. Gachet, you can see a man with grief in his eyes and grief in his face and, and he, he, you know, with the fingers pressed to, to his face, he does seem to be a weary, sad fellow in a way. That, and he does, there's something confusing about the look on his face, isn't there? Um, another aspect that's kind of worrying in this respect is an Van Gogh probably didn't realize this, but the flowers that are on the table in front of Dr. Gachin, I've actually seen that same table when I was in Auvers Souvoise. I was in his garden, I was in his house when I went there last year. Um, that's something I'm going to show you guys in due course, probably in July. But um, And it's a beautiful garden. Um, you know, the, I've got a garden myself and I can appreciate gardens and Dr. Gachet's garden, even today, is quite stunning. It's got a lovely view over Auvers was. In any event, the, the, the foxgloves in the foreground to the picture are unfortunately um, telling us something else. And what they're telling us is Dr. Gachet is a proponent of prescribing digitalis as a, as a treatment. Now, bear in mind the following. This painting is something that, this portrait of Dr. Gachet is something that Vincent has produced within, within um, he's produced this seven to eight days after, or within the time of moving to Auvers, who was. So he basically arrived in this little town and then almost instantly produced this portrait. Like, he arrives and then he produces this portrait. And it's such an important portrait. It, it is one of the most expensive artworks ever sold. And there's another artwork that looks almost identical. It's not quite identical, but it looks very similar. And one of them has sort of disappeared. And there's a lot of conjecture that one of them is fake. And we'll deal with that in due course, but um, it's it's quite extraordinary that all of this happens within essentially the, the, the week that he arrives in Orvez. Now, now, bear in mind, he had to have gotten to know the doctor quite well because taking a portrait takes time. The doctor had to sit for him to, to do this portrait. And while this is happening, they obviously s talk to one another but I think, again, one's got to look at the wood for the trees and what is the wood for the trees saying? Well, look at, look at the way that Van Gogh portrays the doctor with his hand on his face and, and this look on his face. And unfortunately, the doctor prescribing digitalis isn't good for Van Gogh. And what I mean is, if Van Gogh did have any episodes, did have any problems, 
then every time that he received digitalis isn't going to be very good for him, is it? In other words, because it's poisonous. So, so any time the doctor actually intervenes on Van Gogh's behalf, it's not going to be very good for him. He's going to be giving him something that's going to make his condition actually worse. I don't think the doctor knew this. I don't think the doctor knew he was poisoning his patients with digitalis. But the fact is he was. And what one then also wonders what happened to his wife, again, in this respect of the digitalis. Now, before you jump to conclusions, uh, Dr. Geshe prescribing digitalis wasn't out of the norm. It wasn't unusual. It wasn't him being strange. It was quite normal for that time when medical science wasn't very sophisticated. There were certain sort of almost home remedies, but this, this was almost seen as proper medicine, um, but it wasn't. Um, you know, it's that funny line between something that's that's got um, real efficacy. You know, where you you could test that in a medical trial, it's like a drug's got real effectiveness, and something that is either like a placebo or can actually be harmful. And we've got that situation with hydroxychloroquine at the moment with the coronavirus. You know, there's there's the possibility that it is more poisonous or more more um, um, uh, less effective than it is effective, if that makes sense. Uh, it's a little bit different to digitalis, where digitalis is actually a poi poisonous and is not going to help you at all. So Van Gogh, um, in the next line, after the portrait of Dr. Gachet, writes to his brother, I'll very probably also do the portrait of his daughter, who is 19 and with whom I can easily imagine Joe will quickly make friends. So I'm going to stop the uh, reading of the letter from, bear in mind it's from June 3rd at this point. I'll resume reading the June 3rd letter on June 3rd. Uh, before I, I leave you, I just want to emphasize one aspect with the portrait of his daughter. This is uh, an aspect that I think is one of the most misunderstood with Van Gogh. I think it's one of the least acknowledged. And I think it's very much part of when we talk about missing the woods for the trees. When you're talking about a lonely guy in his late 30s, um, what are we talking about? We're talking about a person who is lonely for the conversation with other people in this case his brother his um, his sister-in-law and you know his little nephew but what about for the opposite sex what about I mean mid-30s late 30s is fairly young and as Van Gogh had a girlfriend while he was in the asylum as he had a girlfriend when he was in the yellow house when last did he have a girlfriend who was his last girlfriend does he miss the um, conversation and the company of women? Of course he does. And so when he meets Dr. Gachet, he doesn't just meet Dr. Gachet, he meets Dr. Gachet's daughter. And the other aspect that is very important to bear in mind is there is no Mrs. Gachet. So th there's no um, natural guardian looking after their daughter. Now bear in mind, the doctor's a doctor, so he's busy, and so he would be making several trips to Paris, leaving his daughter behind at home. And Vincent's been invited to visit the garden and paint in the garden and come into the home. And in many depictions, um, it's a situation where the doctor has kind of said, come, come and go as you please and make my home your home. And isn't that what he did? Is that the kind of thing you'd want to do with a guy like Vincent van Gogh who's had this incident at the Yellow House where something happened that his housemate certainly didn't appreciate because his housemate kind of left him quite suddenly. So in terms of the Yellow House, van Gogh behaved in a way that his housemate didn't expect. 
And now Van Gogh's not a housemate in terms of Dr. Gachet, but he's, he's almost that. He's, he's getting the run of the house. And part of the household is a 19-year-old young woman. Bear in mind, Van Gogh's almost like coming out of jail. He's been in the asylum for a year. And within the first week, he meets Dr. Gachet's daughter. And he's already talking about doing her portrait and he, he describes her as 19 and he emphasizes, he says, I can easily imagine Joe will quickly make friends with her. So it's almost like he's saying um, he's giving her, he's giving Dr. Gachet's daughter a vote of confidence. He's, he's almost, it's almost like he wants to include her in the, the, their little circle of friends. Does that make sense? And so very early on, Vincent van Gogh's made contact with the kind of important protagonist in the story, not only Dr. Gachet, but his daughter as well. And we're going to be fleshing out these people, looking at their portraits, examining their portraits in more detail. And I can also talk about Digitalis in more detail if you'd like me to, but you can also just uh, do a search on Wikipedia and just read about um, Digitalis' use in the past as for medicinal in inverted commas purposes. I think you'll agree that, that these letters, the previous one and this one, are, are some of the most interesting we've covered so far and they're going to get more interesting. In any event, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, tomorrow on Patreon will be the Kessinger Tapes, the next episode. And the day after that, uh, the Watts tapes. Uh, as I said, every Tuesday is a brand new series, also on Patreon, on the $3.50 tier on Henry Van Breda. So, so those of you interested can go and have a look at that. Uh, thank you for listening. Stay safe. Uh, make sure you're getting enough sleep and staying healthy, fit and healthy. Look after your immunity. And I'll see you guys next time.